what I wanted to do in this particular video is introduce the concept of a buffer overflow. And you know, primarily my goal is to do two things. One is to describe you know, why they're an interesting problem, what the motivation is behind, why we'd want to study them in more detail, and provide you with a bit of history around how they have evolved over time. And then in subsequent videos, uh, I'll give you more of a flavor for how they work, at least at a high level. So to begin with, buffer overflows are one of the most common the most common software vulnerabilities out there. These are vulnerabilities that they can often be exploited to compromise uh, the security of systems that run vulnerable software. Now, attacks that exploit or take advantage of buffer overflows can be extremely powerful. And, and the reason they can be so powerful is they really allow the attacker uh, what, what's considered the holy grail of exploits. And, and that is what we call remote arbitrary code executions, or remote um, arbitrary code execution. And really, this is where an attacker is given essentially uh, free reign, carte blanche access to the system and is allowed to effectively execute any possible set of instructions of their volition. Uh, now, this doesn't always apply to every buffer overflow, but a lot of buffer overflows can lead to this type of, of remote arbitrary code execution. All right, and at that point, the attacker can really just wreak havoc uh, in any manner that they wish on that particular system that's exploitable. Now, at one point, uh, buffer overflows used to be the most common uh, software vulnerability that was kind of out there. Um, and, and nowadays, I would say their popularity has been eclipsed uh, somewhat by other vulnerabilities. So, for example, you see a lot of vulnerabilities today that are geared around uh, web applications and, and uh, web application-related vulnerabilities. And some of these things include uh, notions like cross-site scripting attacks, uh, SQL injection attacks, uh, SQL injection, which uh, you often hear about in the news, and then cross-site request forgeries uh, or XSRF attacks. And, and these are um, attacks that I won't cover in this particular video or set of videos, but I might cover some of these in the future as well. Now, many of these software vulnerabilities, just actually many software vulnerabilities in general, uh, tend to have a flavor that's very similar to that of the buffer overflow. So if you can understand how a buffer overflow works, um, even at a high level, that'll give you a sense, or at least a flavor, for how many other software vulnerabilities work in the wild. Now, conceptually, conceptually speaking, people have known about buffer overflows since like the late 1970s. All right. Though one of the most famous examples, the most well-known instances of a buffer overflow exploit in the wild, occurred in 1988. And that was via what was called the Morris worm, uh, the Morris worm. And this was a, a worm which basically took advantage of a vulnerability, it exploited a vulnerability in what was called the Finger D program. The Finger D program is basically a program that is available on Unix systems, and it's basically used to respond to requests that are made by what's called a finger protocol. And the finger protocol itself is used for remotely obtaining information about the users on a system. So basically, Robert Morris, who is the, the person who wrote the, the Morris worm, actually found uh, a vulnerability in the Finger D program. He exploited that vulnerability to create a worm that could spread across networks. And at that time, the internet was nowhere near the size that it is today, but that worm ended up, did take down quite a bit of the internet. Now, it's interesting. So Robert Morris and I have a, a bit of a, have had an interaction. He actually was on my area exam committee when I was a graduate student. Actually, Robert Morris is now currently on faculty at MIT, uh, and uh, uh, he was on my area exam committee. The topic for that committee that I was supposed to research was denial of service attacks, and it certainly was um, intimidating, if, if to say the least, to talk about denial of service attacks with the guy who came up with uh, the Morris worm. Uh, but that aside, I mean, and, and you know, to, to be fair, I think that when he came up with this worm, he was doing it more as an interesting exercise in, in sort of technical ability versus something that was designed to cause a lot of damage. In fact, there was a small bug in that worm um, in terms of how it replicated that actually was responsible for some of the damage that, that worm caused. And I don't think his intention was necessarily to, to cause all this damage. He was trying to see if he could um, you know, get a piece of software to propagate across a network. Uh, but since the Morris worm, there have been other instances of uh, worms that have been in, other instances of malicious software that have taken advantage of buffer overflows uh, that are more nefarious in nature. So one of the, the most well-known examples of that was in 2001 with the, the code red, the code, let me spell that correctly, code red worm. And, and code red basically took advantage 
of a vulnerability, a buffer overflow vulnerability in IIS, and I believe the version was, I think, 5.0. And uh, another example after that was in 2003, there was a worm called SQL Slammer. And you might have heard of some of these worms like Code Red and SQL Slammer. They caused an enormous amount of damage. And, and SQL Slammer in particular took advantage of a vulnerability in uh, Microsoft's uh, SQL Server, SQL Server, which was a, uh, a well-known software package at that time. And it was quite widely deployed. And so because these applications like IIS and SQL Server were so widely deployed and because they had these vulnerabilities, uh, threats that took advantage of those vulnerabilities uh, did tend to cause a lot of damage. And both of these worms did spread at just an incredible rate and, and caused you know, a lot of financial damage. All right, so hopefully that gives you a sense for why buffer overflows are you know, interesting to study and, and kind of how they've evolved over time. What I'm going to do in the next video is give you more of a flavor for how buffer overflows work.